been thinking about the fact this last week, uh, it's not just this last week, but for a long time, that there's no two people that are exactly the same. Even identical twins, if you've ever been around them, they, they're different. And each of us think differently, we act differently, we react differently, we process information differently. And having spent some time in the business world before going into the ministry, it's a pretty accepted fact that people are different. And there's multiple tests that are given that are out in the world uh, uh, and even in Christian circles now. And here's four common ones. You've got the Myers-Briggs one, you've got the DISC, and, and then you throw in the Christians ones where you've done this, maybe your spiritual gift or, or the famous book here a few years ago now about the love languages, how we all respond differently. Uh, each of them are acknowledging a fact that there are differences and also that it would be good to try to figure out what those traits are so we can learn to understand one another and how a person thinks and acts. And then there's some new ones that have come out. If you can see that, the, uh, the toothpaste personality test. Maybe you have that in your own home and it's pretty self-explanatory. And then the results that I had down there on the bottom about, I took the test and didn't get any score. You got none? Yeah, I don't have a personality. So... <clears throat> All right, fine, we'll just move on. They're all different, we're all different, and some of us are very confident, some of us not so much. Uh, some of us are outgoing, some of us are shy, some of us feel like we never make a mistake, some of us think we've never done anything right. And so it, it's helpful to learn these things about the people that we hang out with, the people we're married to in our family and we work with. Uh, but I need to throw a fence up is that all of these tests and all of these things that reveal differences are not an excuse to remain in, a sin, in our sin or to have a bad attitude. I can't just say, well, I'm, a, I'm in the D part of the disc thing, therefore I get to be obnoxious. No. You know, we're to be Christ-like and we are to learn what our tendencies are and what our strengths and weaknesses are so that we can bring those things before the Lord and, and not excuse our unchristlike behavior on some test that's out there. The, the goal is to learn to love one another and all of us as we mature should have the goal of seeing more and more fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives and not excusing our behavior because we have a tendency to be some certain way. God wants us to grow and change and as we're working our way through 1 John, we've left off um, here, and I want to just read these couple verses, three verses, and then we'll go back and dissect them a little bit. He says in uh, 1 John 3, 19, By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before Him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And then he goes on and talks about prayer, but... He starts off with this by this, and, and whenever you run into those sort of things in the Scripture, you need to tie it back to what he was talking about and see what the context is. And, and he's talking about the previous verses, and what those verses referred to is that we're God's children. And love has been poured out on us, and now we are commanded to love one another. We can freely love because we have been loved freely. We know that we're different after we're born again. And one of the ways we know that is that hatred leaves our lives, or, or should. Our value system changes, or should. We begin to develop more of an eternal perspective instead of a temporal perspective. We start viewing this life through the prism of eternity and through the Holy Spirit. We now drive by and see somebody in need, and we, we have an urge to help them. I don't know what you were like before you were saved. I was one of those guys who drive by and say, <laughs> tough luck, buddy. Maybe you were one of those that were more mercy-oriented, and so you would stop and do something for them. But even if you were mercy-oriented, you didn't care about their eternal soul. Now we see people and we go, there, there's something that matters here. It's eternity. What's going to come next in their life? Not just meeting a temporal need. We care about walking in a way that pleases our Heavenly Father now. We didn't. We want to live and obey what has been revealed. So John says, by this, by this whole love thing, we know that we are of the truth. We want to walk in the truth and not willingly hold to lies or to errors. And when we're not in the truth, when we're out of sorts, when we're contrary to the Word of God, we're bothered by it, or should be. It's called conviction. We, we get convicted about those things. John's readers of his letter that he's sending him were being told by those that were causing division that they were deceived and they were believing lies coming from John. 
The, the, the people that had split the community were still trying to get people to go away from them, to come away from them, so they were spreading untruths. They were still using the Garden of Eden trick. Remember what that was? John's not telling you the truth here. Or he's not telling you all the truth. You could be free like we are. You don't have to be bound up with all this legalism stuff. You could go gratify your flesh because your flesh doesn't matter. You could be like us and you could be free. John's not telling you the truth. John is leading you astray. Come follow us. We have a deeper knowledge and so forth. He doesn't want you to grow. He doesn't want you to be free. He doesn't want you to experience the things that we're experiencing and it's good over here. You hear the serpent in there with the, don't eat the fruit. God, did, God knows that when you eat it, it's going to be better than what you imagine. You'll know this, that, and the other. They're doing the same thing here. And John says, we're in the truth, and that truth is Christ. These guys that have broken away and are denying Jesus are not in the truth, though they are boldly proclaim it, proclaiming it. Kind of sounds like our world, doesn't it? <laughs> we're the truth, really? No, they're not. John states that we are of the truth, and, and just knowing that we are in the truth, sadly, doesn't end the battle, or at least it doesn't for me. And he uses this word that says, we need to reassure our hearts, and that word is actually persuade in the Greek. And what it speaks to me, and maybe it doesn't to you, but for me, there's usually a, a battle going on in my brain over what I believe and why I believe it, why I do the things I do, or why I don't do the things that I don't do. I need reassuring at times that what I'm doing is right. Yeah. I need to know how my relationship is with my Creator. And there are times that it's a struggle. Maybe John, when he wrote this, was just thinking about what he just told the people, which was, you got to walk in love like Christ loved the church. I don't know about you, but that's a struggle for me. Dying to myself is not one of my strong suits. <laughs> Laying down my life for the expense of everyone else is not something that I excel in. It's a battle that I have. Learning to walk in Christ-like love is difficult sometimes. So maybe John in his mind says, you guys are in the truth, but you need to reassure your heart that even though you're failing, you're, you're okay with God. You're doing all right. The Lord, I believe, helped my unbelief syndrome. You ever had that? Paul saying, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I should do, I just don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. And I'm, yuck. That happens sometimes. It rages in our hearts and minds. And again, depending on our personality, some of us need some truth and reassurance on a regular basis that we're okay and that we're doing all right and that God loves us and He's not upset with us. So we get to verse 20 in this as John's talking, and he says, For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. This is helpful to me. Because he uses the word whenever. <laughs> and when he says whenever, what he means is that it's possible for that to happen. Does your heart condemn you sometimes? Do you get overwhelmed with feeling like you've messed up? That God couldn't love you anymore? That you've outfailed the grace of God? Here we go again, God. I said I wasn't going to do it, and I did it. I said I wasn't going to speak that way, and I spoke that way. I said I wasn't going to go that direction, and I went that direction. Do we feel like that sometimes, that we have out the grace of God? And he says, whenever our heart condemns us, condemn is a strong word. It, it means, literally, properly, to find as decisively guilty and on the basis of direct personal acquaintance, specifically condemned by having a firsthand awareness of the facts. Most of us do not need a lot of outside influence to tell us how bad we have messed up do we? Most of us, pretty good handle, first-hand experience of how we have fallen or failed or let something down. Again, some of us maybe are more oblivious to it, but many of us struggle with feeling like we're a failure or we're unproductive or we're ineffective or we haven't done anything that matters. We know firsthand what we're like, don't we? Is it just me that struggles with this? I know it isn't. I read a lot. I'm reading a book by a guy who's got a worldwide ministry, and he says, I have to go to bed on a weekly basis because I'm so depressed over not doing anything for God. I know he struggles with this. A lot of people do. Condemnation is a powerful tool by our enemy. 
And because we know ourselves and we have this specific firsthand experience and awareness of our faults, we cannot imagine that someone would love us and we certainly can't imagine that God would love us. We just don't. How could God possibly love me? I know what I'm like. How could he love me? How could anybody who really knew me love me? We get convicted of, of being prideful. And so then we humble ourselves and then we're convicted because we're proud of our humility. Circular, but struggle with that. The voices within our hearts and minds can shout and they often overwhelm the truth. Add to that, we have an adversary, and you guys know this. Finally, we get through the book of Revelation, we get to the end of it, and we see what happens to him. But he says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and his authority of his Christ have come. Why? For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. And he accuses them night and day before our God. Not only is he accusing them before our God, he accuses them in my brain. And I'm pretty good at it myself, are you? Do you struggle with this at all? John points to the reality and the solution, and I'm so grateful for that, because he says, when our heart condemns us, we need to understand something. God's greater than our heart. God is greater than our heart. He's all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing, is everywhere and all-wise. He's the sovereign creator of the universe. He holds everything together by the word of his power. He is the sustainer of everything. He is the ultimate judge of all kings, all nations, anyone who's ever lived or will live. This one is greater than our heart. He's greater than the one that accuses us. (laughs) That's good news. This one paid the price for our sins. He's granted us salvation and eternal life through Jesus' sacrifice. This is the one we should turn our focus upon and not ourself. He says, when our heart condemns us, and yes, it happens, our heart condemns us, God's greater than our heart. Don't forget that. God is greater than our heart. And he knows everything. I love this. God knows everything, and that includes you and I. (laughs) Our thoughts, our intentions, our actions, our reactions, our sins, Everything we conceal from everybody else, God knows it. The good, the bad, the ugly. He knows it all. (laughs) And guess what? He loves us. What could the devil possibly tell God that he doesn't know about us? What, What could I tell God that he doesn't know about me? I know you love me, God, but you just don't know me. I know you formed me in my mother's womb and you know everything and every breath and every thought and every action, but you're just not aware of how wicked I really am. Really? God knows. God knows all of it. He says when our heart condemns us, we need to understand that God knows us. God knows everything. He knows what he's doing in the life of his people. He knows what he's going to do in the life of his people. Have we read the scripture with a mind that sees a redemptive God? Who is the father of faith? Who's the the father of faith in the Bible? Abraham, right? Abraham is the father of faith. This guy was so fearful for his life that he told two different guys, not once, twice, he put his wife into some other man's harem. God says he's the father of the faith. You don't think God knew that? That Abraham had some serious personal issues? How do you do that? She's my sister. Don't kill me. Good example, right? King David. Do I even need to go there? Murderer, adulterer, liar, miserable father. Ah, I know they're being a jerk. We'll just ignore them. Things will get better. Yeah, like it always does when we ignore it. What did God say about King David? He's a man after my own heart. Really? God, do you know David? Yeah, I know David quite well, thank you. I know what I'm doing in his life and his heart. Jesus knew that one of his dearest earthly friends, part of the inner circle, the big three, (laughs) brash, outlandish, he knew that he would deny him in his darkest hour. (laughs) Not once, not twice, three times. (laughs) In one of the Gospels, I don't remember which one it is now, but it says Jesus turned and looked at him the third time he did it. He was right there. And Jesus turned and looked at him, and he knew exactly what
what Peter was going to do, yet he washed his feet. He loved him. He restores him. He goes out of his way to restore him. And who gives a sermon on Pentecost when bunches of thousands of people are saved? Peter. God does that kind of stuff. Why? Because he loves us. It's impossible to read through the scripture and find any character other than Jesus that is perfect. Read Hebrews 11 sometime and read it with an eye to who these guys were and what they did. <laughs> You're going, wow. And yet, God loves them. God knows us. He loves us. There's no condemnation for us. There's conviction, yes, but he's given us the gift of repentance after we're believers. And when God points something out in our life, we go to a throne of grace and mercy to receive help in our time of need is what the scripture says. I love the way Spurgeon comments on this verse. He says, sometimes our heart condemns, condemns us, but in doing so, it gives a wrong verdict. And then we have the satisfaction of being able to take the case into a higher court. <laughs> For God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. <laughs> My heart can condemn me. I can spend way too much time focusing on what I did wrong or what I didn't do or how I failed or what I should have done and so forth. I can go to a higher court. <laughs> and I go into the presence of my Father. And he says, I love you. I forgive you. I cleanse you. I restore you. Now go. <laughs> so the question is, who are we going to believe? <laughs> Our heart? The devil or God? We have a choice. Who are we going to believe when it comes to being condemned? God help us to believe the word of God. So we get to 21. This verse makes sense to me now. It says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. If we have an understanding of our relationship with God that's based on a covenant that was cut in the cross of Jesus Christ, and it's not based on my perfect behavior at all time. I will have confidence to go before my Father anytime. I wasn't perfect to begin with. <laughs> While I was his enemy, he loved me. How much more is his child now? I have confidence to go before the throne of God Almighty. We're dearly loved and righteous children of God. Confidence means boldness, freedom to speak, and cheerful courage. I love that picture. I don't think you can see it or not, but... Jesus is smiling as he's holding kids. And I've often said, I don't think Jesus was a snarly sourpuss. Kids do not go to people that are snarly sourpusses. They cower and run away. But when somebody's got a winsome smile, they're drawn to them. And I think Jesus did. Confidence means we have boldness. We have freedom to go into the throne room of God. Think about it. I'll, I'll, if I was a king and I'm not, but if I was, and I had a child, and let's say I was sitting on my throne, and the child came running in and needed something, they were struggling, maybe they just wanted a drive-by snuggle, you know, where they, where they run in and they grab your leg and, and run off or whatever, wouldn't I receive them? I mean, most of the fathers in here, you love it when your, your little daughter or your son comes in and wants to sit on your lap or wants to confide in something, or tell you something, or, or they've done something, you make time for them. Wouldn't we stop and do that? And, and if we as earthly fathers would do that, wouldn't my perfect, loving, heavenly father do that for me? <laughs> he loved us so much, he paid the ultimate sacrifice of sending his son to die for us. While we hated him, he sent his son to die for us. How much more Will he love us now that we're his children? Will he love us less now that we're his children? We can't shock him. We cannot shock God with our behavior or lack of behavior. It, it, it doesn't. He loves us. And we have an invitation from him repeatedly in Scripture. I'll just share a couple with you. Let us then with confidence, confidence, boldness, so forth, draw near to the throne of grace. Why? That we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's an invitation from the one who sits on the throne. Let us draw with confidence. It's also later on in the book. It says, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near, draw near, with a full or with a true heart in full assurance of faith, 
with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? For he who promised is faithful. Draw near because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Draw near. The enemy shouts, stay away. You're dirty, you're ugly, you're nasty. God cannot forgive you. You've not failed the grace of God. The scripture, the truth of God's word says, draw near. Come, 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 draw near. Doesn't matter what you've done, come near. Any dad in here who had a child that came to them in humility and repentance wouldn't kick them. <laughs> We'd love them, forgive them, encourage them, and help them. What's God after? He says, Jesus answered him, if, you, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And what will happen? We'll come to him. We'll make our home with him. Does that sound like somebody who doesn't want us around? <laughs> Don't believe the lies of the enemy. We have confidence before the throne. We can have our heart full of assurance, and we can know that God wants to dwell with us. God loves us even though he knows us. So this verse, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. We do not have to give in to condemnation. We do not have to believe the lies of the enemy. We believe the truth of the scripture. And that foundation is what John is laying on, on how to move into effective prayer. But that'll be next time. So I've just got some questions. I got this far and I just got inundated with all these questions. Why did God do this? Why did God make us different? I mean, if, if you're married to somebody, you're different than them, right? You have a child and, and they're different than you are. And then you, you know, add more children. No, the two are like, they're not cookie cutters, right? They're all different. Why? Is God just bored? Did he just want some drama something to laugh at from heaven <laughs> it's a good question to think about god had a purpose a plan he's a creator he's a sovereign god of the universe <laughs> he has a plan and he made us different each of us we think differently process differently so what would happen in our homes in our jobs in our in, in the way we live if we started appreciating those things instead of fighting them all the time. Many young couples, when they're first married, struggle with trying to get the other person to see things the right way, which, of course, is their way. <laughs> instead of appreciating the differences, God brought two people together that are different, and the two will see things differently than just the one, and it's good. It's good to look at things from multiple angles to see a better solution. So what would happen in real life if we actually tried to practice this? Beginning in the relationships that are closest to us. Of course men and women are different. Duh. They spend millions of dollars to determine these studies. Boy, that's rocket science, isn't it? Of course we're different. We think differently, but let's partner on those things instead of fussing and fighting each other all the time about them and see if we come up with better solutions to the situations that are there. Why does our heart need reassuring? And maybe it's just me. I know it isn't, but I'm trying to be gracious. I know that there's people in here specifically that struggle with wondering what kind of relationship they really have with God, wondering if God really does love them. Could God possibly know everything that they've done or what they think about or how they've, how they've done when nobody else is around and still love them? The answer is yes. God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. There is no doubt about it. And you're either going to believe the Word of God or you're going to believe the enemy or your heart. God's greater than our heart, and He loves you. So why does our heart need reassuring? Because there are times we doubt and struggle. There are just times when we fail. What's the difference between conviction and condemnation? I have this conversation on a regular basis. Many people walk around carrying the weight of condemnation. There is a difference. Do we know it? Do we recognize it? Have we thought about it? Have we thought deeply about it? I'll give you a general definition for it. Conviction is specific. Condemnation is general. Specific conviction is you were in this situation, click, and you were rude to this person. 
You cared more about sharing your view than listening to their heart. That's specific. Condemnation is, you are such a loser, you're never going to learn anything, and God is sick and tired of you the way you are. He's tired, and he's just done with it with you. How do I repent of that? God, I repent for being a loser. I mean, I, I don't know how to repent of that. I can repent of a specific thing. There's more to it than that, but that's a good place to at least start. <laughs> if God points something out to you specifically, then deal with it. If you have a general foreboding of your horribleness, reject that. You're a child of God, <laughs> a child of the king. So what's your view of God's love towards you? Is he just putting up with you? Oh, I suppose I'll let you into heaven. Probably plenty of room, even for the likes of you. I mean, is that what our view of God's love is for us? One more time. You mess one more time. I've had it with you up to here. I have run out of that fountain of blood. What's our view of God's love? <laughs> I need to think through it. How do we gain confidence to boldly enter the throne room of heaven if we lack it? Didn't it say twice, just in those two verses that I read, draw near to God with confidence, full assurance, having our hearts sprinkled? We go into the throne room. If you went to the Esther play, she risks her life. She goes in before a pagan king, and unless he holds out that scepter, she's toast. We go to a throne room of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the scepter is always ours. <laughs> We're his children, and he loves us. There is no doubt about it. And if you believe something else, it is a lie. Don't believe it. So the bottom line question then is, are you a child of the King? <laughs> if you are, wow. We're King's kids. It does not get any better than this. My dad is the dad. He, he is the dad of all dads. He owns everything. He holds the universe together by his hand, it, by, the, by the word of his power. He, it just, my dad is awesome. Are you a child of that dad? You can be if you're not. And if you are, then we need to renew our minds into how he looks at us and what he thinks of us. So if you're in here today and you're bound up in sin, I've got good news for you. Your Father loves you. He wants to set you free. He wants to give you a new heart and a new life. If you came in here and your life has been a series of disasters, one after another after another, I've got most excellent news for you. It can change today. It can change right now. By the power and grace of God. Don't leave here until you answer this fundamental question, I'm a child of the King. And then spend the rest of your life learning what it means to be a dearly loved child of God. What a challenge. Uh, pray you wouldn't waste it. Here's what I want to pray about this. God, I am so very grateful. As we sang today, Lord, I am overwhelmed at times, most times, with your mercy.